Welcome to Thrive Church. We're so happy to have you here with us. Uh, if you don't know me, my name is Judah. I'm lead pastor here at Thrive, and we welcome you to all of our campuses, Torrington, New Britain, Terryville, online, on TV. We are so grateful that you are here with us, and we are in a uh, series called Get a Grip. And throughout this series, we're talking about, you know, the things that we should be holding on to. Thank you. We should be holding on to in our life. And, and what we're going to actually be doing starting next uh, uh, week, th this coming week on January the 15th, we're going to be starting a 21-day fast as a church. And this is an opportunity for us to, to give up something, uh, maybe maybe giving up a meal or a type of food or, or giving up uh, some things like that in order to spend our time growing closer to God. You know, we see throughout the Bible, people, when they wanted God to move on their behalf, they would dedicate themselves to prayer and dedicate themselves to fasting, going without food and allowing the hunger pains that we tend to have to inspire us to get into God's word and to pray. So we're gonna be starting that. And, uh, and there's a little uh, handout that you've probably got at the door. If not, they're in the info bar. And it just kind of gives some ideas of some things that you could maybe do. There's also uh, a Bible reading plan if you need uh, something to do. There's two different levels. You can either read through the book of John with us or you can read through the entire New Testament uh, as we go through this 21-day fast. And I would encourage you to get involved with that. So again, we are in this series, Get a Grip. Has anybody ever told you to get a grip before? You know, it's usually not a very uh, encouraging thing, right? Like it's normally something that somebody says to you when, when things are maybe, you know, going wrong, maybe you're having a breakdown, you know, you're going through a lot of difficulties in life and somebody comes up and says, you know what? You need to get a grip, right? This means you, you need to get, a, get in control of your emotions, get in control of the situation that you're going through in your life. Well, get a grip. This is, this is talking about the ability to hold on to something, whether it's your mental state, whether it's your, your, your relationship with God, maybe it's some spiritual disciplines that we need to get uh, incorporated. And, and today, we're going to be talking about a specific thing, and that is talking about worship. Worship. What, what comes to your mind when you hear the word worship? I guess it kind of depends on, on your background, what you think of. Some people think of, when you think of worship, they think of, of music, Christian music, you know? They say, oh, I listen to music all the time, Christian music. I listen to, to K-Love, right? It's positive and encouraging all the time. Or, or, or for some of us, we, we, we think that, that worship is coming to church and going to a church service. Oh, that's, that's worship. For others, maybe it's a certain routine that we go through that that, that feels like, like worship. See, in the Bible, we learn that worship is more than a song, it's a lifestyle, but it ultimately, it can be very controversial for people when we talk about worship. And if you're new to Christianity, if you're new to, to church, this is all going to seem very logical to you. Like, this is going to make sense to you more than it is to people who've been coming for a long time, because we've sometimes, we get all of our words so confused. So if we look at the Oxford Dictionary, for the definition of worship, it means an act of devotion or reverence directed usually towards a deity. It's a, an act of, of devotion or reverence. It's an act of worship that may be performed individually by myself, or it can be uh, performed in a group together. It's something we can do together. We can pray together. I can pray by myself. I can sing together. I can sing by myself. There's things that we can do together, or I can do individually. Now, different religions in the world have different ways that they worship. Right? So Buddhism, for example, some of the ways that they worship in Buddhism is they do meditation, they do yoga, they, they, they do recitation of things, they drink tea, they give offerings, they, they do different things like that. In Hinduism, they, they like to show love and they, they do this personal reflection and it's art sometimes. In Islam, it's a ritualistic prayer that you have to say five times a day and, and they, they physically have to bow to the ground during the, this prayer time every day. For Judaism or, or Jews, uh, formerly it used to be animal sacrifice, as, as crazy as that may sound, but now it's mostly it's prayer and it's, it's feasts and, and things like the Seder for Passover, and, and, and they, they observe these things, 
even like not working on the Sabbath day, which is Saturday, uh, not working on that day. In fact, there's a company, some of you may or may not have heard of, it's called b and and, and they're a big uh, photography and video equipment store based in New York City. It's an entire city block. It's a massive company. They sell photographic equipment all over the world, and they are run by Jews. And as a result, they shut down their entire business once a week on the Sabbath. But not only do they shut down their business every week, they actually shut down their website as well. Like, they, they will not allow you to buy something. And and that seems okay. It's like, okay, well, once a week you can't order. But then you get some of these other holidays like, like Passover and Yom Kippur, and they just shut it all down. They're like, this is our act of worship. We don't work. We don't labor. We don't do commerce. We don't do business on these days. So for Christianity, what, what do we think of worship? For some of us, we think of, of, of music, or we think of you know, people that raise their hands. In fact, some people, as we're singing, some of us, we raise our hands, we lift our hands, and some of you may be looking around like, like what the heck is wrong with these people? Why are they raising their hands? And, and the best way that, that I can describe it is imagine if you are in a bank, okay, and you're, you're possibly doing a deposit into your bank account, and somebody comes in with a mask and a gun, and they point the gun at you, what are you gonna do? My hands go up. Why? Why, why do my hands go up? I'm saying, I'm surrendering. I'm not holding on to anything. I don't have any weapons. I'm not a threat. I'm just here. And, and, and whatever money I have on me, you can have it. Just please don't hurt me, okay? Like, like that's, that's kind of the idea that we have when we raise our hands. And, and in much the same way, in, in Christian circles, when we, when we raise our hands, it's an act of surrender, saying, I'm surrendering to God. I'm not holding anything back. I'm not holding on to anything, so these are ways that, that different religions, you know, we worship, you know, the, the religion of, of football, for, for example, right? What do we do? We, we buy jerseys, we sit in front of the altar of our TV, we bring food and we sacrifice the food to our, you know, and our bodies as we watch this. I mean, these are ways, see, we worship all different kinds of things, don't we? For some of us, it's a job. For some of us, it's a relationship. For some of us, you know, it's, it's a hobby or a career. We worship all kinds of things. Now, when we talk about church, some people go so far as to say, well, well, praise is the fast songs and worship is the slow songs. And, and we have this whole genre of music and it's called worship music. And it really confuses everybody because that's not what worship is. And especially for people who don't like music very much, it puts them in an awkward place. Like I, I like music, but some people don't like music and they hear the music like, I don't really like that. And if you don't like that, then, then how do you worship then? Like, this is just an idea that only started in the 1960s with this idea of, of music and worship being so synonymous together. Now, many people who call themselves Christians, they don't really have a good biblical understanding of what worship really is. And as a result, we become a generation of people who worship our work, we work at our play, and then we play at our worship. And we don't do any of it well. See, why is this important? Why is this important to you? Why is this important to me? In your notes, if you're taking them, worship is what drives our spiritual life. It's what drives us. Worship is what drives our spiritual life. It, all of us worship something. All of us, like, like you, you may come and you may say, well, I don't know, I don't really worship anything. No, we all worship something. For some of us, it's money. For some of us, it's ourself. For some of us, it's a job, it's an education, it's our popularity, it's our status, it's social media. We all will worship something for one way or the other we will find ourselves worshiping because we're made to worship things. It says in John chapter 4, verse 23, Jesus is speaking to a woman and Jesus is at a well and this woman is there and, and he's asking her for a drink of water, which, which is a very unconventional thing for him to do in that day and age. This lady had a bad reputation. She was at the well at the middle of the day to avoid everybody else because she didn't want people to see them. And so she's there and she's talking to Jesus and Jesus says this because the topic of worship comes up. He says, the time is coming. Indeed, it's here now when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, in spirit, and in truth. Circle those words, in spirit, and in truth. This is the Father is looking for those who will worship him that way, for God is spirit. So those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth, spirit and in truth. See, when we get the idea of worshiping in spirit, this is, this is like just the feelings, right? Maybe you come in and you hear some nice music and, and you're like, wow, I just feel this certain way and I feel moved and I just feel the spirit and, and I'm just living in the moment. 
And, and that's all well and good. But on the other hand, we got the, the people that are focused on the truth. And it's like, well, well, it needs to be, you know, God's word. And, and I need to look at this logically and I need to look at it systematically. And as a result, sometimes maybe there's no, no emotion and no expression. See, there's a balance somewhere in the middle of spirit and truth. This is why even as a church, sometimes there may be songs that you hear that, that are church songs or Christian songs, and maybe you wonder why we don't play certain songs. And sometimes because we're like, you know, it's got a lot of spirit, but it doesn't have any truth in it. Like, like it, maybe, maybe theologically it doesn't line up with God's word, so we avoid stuff like that. But see, in your notes, we need a lifestyle of worship, not just an act of worship. See, see, worship goes far beyond just a simple act of worship. It's a lifestyle. It's something that we do each and every day and every moment. And we all, we all worship something. See, worship isn't just music. It's a way that we live our life. Worship is not just Sunday morning, but it's, a, it's an everyday reality. Are we worshiping God or are we worshiping something else? See, true worship, it begins in the heart. It's, it's us responding to God's love. It's not about us being perfect because none of us are perfect. It's about authenticity and being real before God. See, worship isn't about getting our words right. It's about getting our heart right with God. It says in Romans 12, verse one, it says, therefore I urge you, I urge you, I, I encourage you, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm really pushing you here. He says, therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. It says, this is your true and proper worship. See, us offering our bodies as a sacrifice to God, this is an act of worship. In other words, in other words, God wants you. It doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter your past. It doesn't matter your upbringing. It doesn't matter you, 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 your, you know, how you grew up religiously or, or without it. It doesn't matter your, your political stance. It doesn't matter any of that. It means God wants you every day. And in every moment, there's an opportunity for us to worship God, to give him glory. So in your notes, we worship God by giving our lives to him. We give him our life saying, God, I will give you my life. I will serve you with my time, with my energy. I will serve you with my passions in my life. See, worship is our response to God's love. When we realize how much God has loved us, then we respond to him in love and in, uh, love and in worship. See, we respond to God's love and to his grace and his majesty. See, we don't worship because we have to. If you're worshiping, if you're coming to church, if you're reading the Bible, if you're praying, if you're doing these things simply because you have to, you're doing it for the wrong reason. See, we're doing it because we're moved to, because we're, we're reflecting God's love back. See, every act of kindness and every truth and every time we stand for justice and every time we give generously and every time we help someone in need and every time we're, we're in scripture, we're praying, these are acts of worship. Now, for the Jews... For thousands of years, their act of worship required animal sacrifice or some kind of sacrifice. Maybe it was sheep, but then other kinds of sacrifices as well. It was wine or oil, and, and they would bring these things to the altar, and they would pour them out, and they would give these things to God as a sacrifice. But the verse that we just said is to offer yourself as a living sacrifice, What's the problem with a living sacrifice? Is a living sacrifice can crawl back off that altar if it wants to, right? Like I say, oh, I'm, I'm giving myself to God. And they're like, oh, wow, look at that, a squirrel. And then I'm back over here again. You know, it's, it's like we're just pursuing our own passions. We're pursuing whatever it is that, that, that our interests take us. And, and we're not letting ourselves be truly dedicated to God. He said, I want you to bring yourself as your offering. I want you to give yourself to me. It says in Hebrews Chapter 13, verse 15. It says, therefore, let us offer through Jesus a continual sacrifice of praise to God, proclaiming our allegiance to his name. I like this verse because it's like, it's like a real verse, right? It says, offer a continual, act of, uh, continual sacrifice of praise. What is praise? It means giving thanks to God. It's saying the good deeds that God has done. It's lifting his name up. And, and, and let's be honest, let's be real. Sometimes that's a sacrifice, right? Sometimes we don't feel like it. I'm going through crazy stuff. I'm going through difficulty. I'm going through adversity. I don't wanna thank God. I don't wanna give praise to God. Like, why would I give praise to God for what I'm going through? 
It's all a mess right now. I'm just going through tragedy. I'm going through pain, suffering, and loss. Why would I praise God? He says, let us offer a sacrifice of praise. See, he's acknowledging that for us to give praise to God, it's often, it's a sacrifice. And see, in your notes, we can praise God in the problems. We can praise God in the difficulties. It's not easy to praise God in the problems. It's not easy to to worship when we're worrying about something. It's not easy to give devotion when you're in the middle of depression. But this is exactly what God is encouraging us to do, to give the sacrifice of praise. So what is it that we need to lay down, to lay on the altar? What is it that we need to bring? Maybe some of our goals, our aspirations, maybe it's our, 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 our pursuit of just our own personal gain. Maybe it's pride. You know, in your notes, pride blocks effective worship. See, for many of us, you know who we're worshiping? Ourself, right? It's it's all about me, myself, and I. I pull myself up by my own bootstraps. I did it my way. Oh, look what I've done. Look at all the things that I've accomplished. As if we had any real say in it. As if we had the ability to give ourselves a brain or fingers or toes or the ability to learn and comprehend and do the task that we're doing that we claim that we did all on our own as if we could do that without God's help. See, we're worshiping ourselves rather than worshiping the creator. We're worshiping a piece of creation rather than the one who made it all. So can we reflect God, love to him. Can we respond to him in worship? See, true worship may cost you something. It may cost you something. It may cost you energy. It may cost you a future. It may cost you your passions. See, but worship always has an aspect of sacrifice in it. Giving something that's of worth to someone who's worthy. See, when we offer God something, do we offer God our best or do we offer him our worst? Do we offer God our best or do we offer him the leftovers, right? Imagine you're having company for for a big get-together. You're having a holiday meal at your house and everybody goes there and they have these great expectations for this wonderful meal that you're gonna do. And you say, hey guys, I'm gonna break out the leftovers for everybody. Like we had these two weeks ago. I hope they're still okay. Just scrape the mold off a little bit. It'll be fine, I'm sure. Like, are we giving our best to people or are we giving, giving just the leftovers? When it comes to us worshiping God, are we giving the best or are we giving just simply what's left over? In Matthew 14, verse 28, I love this story. Most of us have probably heard this story. This is the story about Peter walking on the water, okay? But we're gonna take a look at a spot of this, a portion of this that most of us, we kind of just blow right by. But this is Peter walking on the water, right? So, so just for context here, the disciples, Jesus' friends, they're out on a boat. There's a storm. They think they're gonna die. The storm is just raging on. And then they see what they think is a ghost walking to them on the water. It's Jesus. It says here, Matthew 14, 28, then Peter called to him, Lord, if it's really you, Tell me to come to you walking on the water. So first off, we gotta give props to Peter, right? Because like if you're out there in the middle of the night on the water in a storm, I don't know if you've ever been in that situation before, but it's kind of scary. You're out there, you're in in the, the boat in a storm. You see somebody walking on the water. What's the first thought in your mind? Not, hey, can I come out there with you, right? That's not usually what we're thinking. But that's what Peter's like, hey man, I'll come out there with you, we'll, 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 we'll do this. So Peter says, if it's really you, tell me to come to you walking on the water. Verse 29, yes, come, Jesus said. And Peter went over the side of the boat and he walked on the water towards Jesus. But when he saw the strong wind and the waves, he was terrified and he began to sink. Save me, Lord, he shouted. And Jesus immediately reached out and he grabbed him. You have so little faith, Jesus said. Why did you doubt me? And then when they climbed back in the boat, then the wind stopped. Now, now this is the part of the story that many of us are familiar with, right? So Peter, he's out there walking in the water and he takes his eyes off of Jesus. And instead of looking at Jesus, he looks at the wind and the waves. And honestly, we're like that a lot too. We take our eyes off Jesus and we start putting our eyes on our problems, on our sickness, on our pain, on our suffering, on our, on our financial problems, on all of these things. We start taking our eyes and putting it on the problem, and then we begin to sink like Peter did. Peter takes his eyes off Jesus, and he begins to sink. And Jesus reaches out his hand and lifts him back up and says, hey, let's get back to the boat. They go to the boat, the winds and the waves, they stop. But the verse I want to look at is verse 33. It says, then the disciples worshiped him. You really are the son of God, they exclaim. Then the disciples worshiped him. And I just think it's kind of interesting that they're in awe right now of this situation, of this miracle that they just saw, and now they started to worship. And I guess it's better late than never, right? But they hadn't been worshiping him before. 
See, I think the point here is that you can worship God in the middle of the storm. You can worship God when it seems like everything is coming against you. And see, see, they now, they realize that they're in the presence of God and now they pause. They're like, wow, God is here. Did you know God is here with us right now? He never leaves us, never forsakes us. He's with us right now. In this very moment, God's presence is here. And are we aware of that? Or are we just going through life oblivious? See, they started out in fear and they were anxious and they were worried. But then once they saw the miraculous, then they decided to worship. But see, in your notes, we can choose worship instead of worry. We can choose to worship God in the difficulty instead of worrying. Instead of worrying about the things that we're going through, the problems, we can choose to worship God. In this story, their worship was a reaction to God's goodness. And when we see what God has done, yeah, we can't help but worship You know, when you're going through a hardship and then God really moves in a powerful way and now you're like, wow, God, thank you so much. Now I want to praise you. But can we praise him still when when we don't know the outcome, when we're going through difficulties? See, here's here's a pro tip. This is where God's blessing really lives. If you want to be blessed by God, listen to this, is that we can worship God through the hard times that we can praise God in the difficulty, that we can worship God before we know the outcome. When you don't know what's gonna happen, when you don't know what you're gonna face, when you don't know know, the the situation and how it's gonna end, we can still worship God. So how do we get a grip on worship? How do we get a grip on this? We start by finding moments each day to be aware of God's presence, just to be aware that God is here with us. And we take every opportunity to worship him by serving, by reading scripture, by listening for his voice. We we worship him through the adventure of life that we're going through. In your notes, that we can praise God even when we're walking through pain. Yet I will praise when I'm going through pain, when I'm going through difficulty. It says in Habakkuk chapter three, verse 17. It says, even though the fig trees have no blossom. Now this is from the Old Testament, first part of the Bible before Jesus comes on the scene. The prophet Habakkuk says this, even though the fig trees have no blossoms and there's no grapes on the vine and even though the olive crop fails and the fields lie empty and barren and even though the flocks die in the fields and the cattle barns are empty. In other words, everything that could go wrong has gone wrong. He said, you don't have any money in the bank. You don't have any food in the the cabinets. You don't have anything to eat in the refrigerator. In fact, the stores, they don't even have any food. And here he says, this is what's going on. He says, there's no blossoms on the fig tree. There's no grapes. There's no olive crops. And he says, the cattle barns are empty. Verse 18, underline this. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. Even when I'm going through difficulty, I'm gonna rejoice. I'm gonna give thanks to God. I'm gonna praise him. I'm gonna worship God. He says, I will be joyful in the God of my salvation. Are we letting things steal our joy? Are we letting things steal our song? Are we letting things steal our worship? Don't let sickness steal your worship. Don't let politics steal your worship. Don't let pain steal or relationship problems, or rejection, or barrenness, or worry, or fear. Don't let these things steal your ability to worship and praise God. Keep on singing, keep on praising, keep on worshiping in the middle of it. See, even nature declares how awesome our God is when Jesus was coming in and people were praising him and people were getting kind of critical of that. He says, if they weren't praising me, even the rocks would praise me. Then I'm not gonna let a rock out worship me. I'm not gonna let the rocks praise God more than me. See, he has saved me and he has redeemed me and he has healed me and he's forgiven me and he's raised me up and blessed me and I can't help but praise him. And if you allow him, he will do a work in your life. And when we see the goodness of God, we cannot help but to respond to him by giving him thanks, by worshiping him because I know what God has done. And not only do I know what he's done, I know what God is capable of. And I know that he is worthy. And it's never, never a waste when we're worshiping God. Are we pouring it out? There's a story in the Bible in Jesus, and he's at a party, and a lady, she comes up and pours out this expensive perfume on his feet. And everybody gets all salty and so critical about what she did. She said, oh, that that perfume could have been sold and 
The money could have helped the poor. But no, she says, I'm giving my best to Jesus. I'm giving my best. I'm giving everything I have, and I'm going to worship him in this way. Are we pouring out our best? I know there might have been death in your life. There may be shame in your past. There may be regret and things that you wish you could forget about. But there is nothing left for us to do than to call on the name of the Lord. See, the God, God, he deserves so much because he's done so many good things. And, and maybe you're going through difficulty right now. What did it say in the, the end of that verse? Is yet yeah, I will rejoice in the Lord. Maybe you're going through hardships right now. And can we say, yet I will rejoice. Maybe you're going through a storm right now. Yet I will rejoice. Maybe you're experiencing physical pain right now. Yet I will rejoice. Maybe you're experiencing emotional and mental pain right now. Yet I will rejoice. Maybe you're going through loss right now. Yet I will rejoice. Maybe you're battling abuse right now. Yet I will rejoice. Maybe you're struggling to break the bondages of addiction right now. Yet I will rejoice. Maybe you're going through bankruptcy right now. Yet I will rejoice. We can hold Hold on to worship. We can hold on to praise and give it to our God who is worthy of all of our praise. Let's pray together. God, we come to you now. We thank you for your goodness. And even in the middle of the difficulties, we're going to choose to praise you. We're going to choose to rejoice because you are good and you are merciful and you are strong. So we come to you now in the middle of the storm, in the middle of the pain. We say thank you. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus as your Lord, don't let another day go by. Maybe you've been just living for yourself, living for your own interests, your own pursuits. God loves you and he wants you in his family. And he says, anyone who calls on his name will be saved. Do you believe that God raised Jesus from the dead? If so, he says, then call on his name. Say, Jesus, you are my Lord. And if that's where you are, won't you call on him now and say, Jesus, you are my Lord. I give you thanks. God, many of us are facing some tough stuff right now. But we come to you now and we ask you to intervene. We ask you to make a way where it seems like there is no way. We ask you to move in a powerful way. We ask you to bring the miraculous. But even if you don't, we choose to praise you. We choose to worship you. We choose to lift your name on high because you are good, because you are faithful, you are strong, you are powerful. You've loved us unlike any others. You've never left us, you've never forsaken us. You've always been there guiding us, leading us, instructing us, protecting us. When all health, health seems lost, we know that you are there with us, leading us on. So we give you our trust, we give you our faith, we call on you, we praise you, we worship you, and we give you thanks because even if our situation is not good, we we know that you are good and that you love us and you will see us through to the other side. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together and sing.